Hello and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining this webinar on Interconnectors, hosted by Phil Fisher in partnership with Beringa and Nemolink. My name is David Haverbeke. I'm an energy regulatory partner in Phil Fisher's Brussels office. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to this discussion. We had, of course, hoped to welcome you, like we did last year, to our Brussels office for our Interconnector Forum. But for obvious reasons, we have made this a virtual meeting. We do hope everybody's well and managing OK in these challenging circumstances. The reason for this webinar is to discuss the topic of interconnectors as we continue to see these markets evolve in various ways. We have selected today a number of those um, um, issues with the focus on economics, on technical, on regulatory and legal um, aspects. This uh, will be shown by our, our, our panel. As underlined today, we have with four presentations of roughly 10 minutes each. Uh, first in line, Mona de Pratre, who is a products and services manager at Nimolink, who will start us off by sharing his experiences of that particular interconnector. Then we will have two of my colleagues from Phil Fish in London, Liz Blunsden from, uh, from the energy regulatory team, and Johanna Weber from the planning and env environmental team, who will give an update on the regulatory position in the UK. Then we will have my colleague Walter van Dorpe, who is an energy regulatory lawyer, counsel here in Brussels, who will be discussing the Baltic cable case and the recent decision of the European Court of Justice. And finally, we will have a presentation from Matthew Grant, a senior manager and partner at Beringa, with his technical insights on hybrid interconnector projects. So before handing over to Mono, I would also like to remind everyone that there will be a Q&A session after the presentations. And we would be very happy to answer any questions you may have about the presentation or the interconnector market in general. For that, please use the chat function on, function on your control panel and to send us the questions. My colleague, Laura, will coordinate the Q&A later on in the webinar before closing our discussions. With that, uh, I'm pleased to hand over to Mona. The floor is yours. That's great. Thanks. Thanks a lot for that um, that introduction. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Mono de Prater, Products and Services Manager um, at Nemolink. Um, just a couple of topics I want to raise today, as you see on the agenda. First of all, I'd like to just quickly introduce ourselves uh, through a couple of numbers and talk a bit about our product offering. Uh, secondly, uh, we'll have a quick look at the current market dynamics, obviously very influenced by uh, COVID. And thirdly, uh, we'll uh, talk about post-Brexit trading arrangements, um, obviously quite critical for a cable between Belgium and GB. So let's dive straight in, uh, kind of going to the to the next slide. Um, I mean, first of all, basics. Nemo Link is an interconnector between the UK and and Belgium, uh, as I assume most of you uh, you will know. Uh, we're relatively new. Uh, we recently celebrated our first year of operation uh, this uh, February. Um, and Nemolink is a 50-50 is a joint venture between National Grid and Elia, uh, so the respective uh, system operators in, in, in GB and, uh, and Belgium. Um, our business is really selling uh, our cable capacity to, to market partners, par um, parties, um, and we do that in different timeframes. Uh, so we have long-term products where we sell capacity uh, a year ahead, quarter ahead, uh, up to a month ahead. Um, and then uh, we sell actually the bulk of our capacity uh, at the day ahead stage, uh, which I'll talk a, a little bit more about in, the, in later slides. Um, and actually sort of a, a quite recent addition to our product offering is our intraday product. Um, and we're sort of actually the, the, on the first channel interconnector to implement the uh, the intraday product with 24 nomination gates. And I'll just uh, I'll cover that briefly in a bit um, as well. In addition to that, we also provide some ancillary services. You know, we're active in the the British uh, capacity mechanism, 
uh, we provide uh, stuff like reactive power and we have the capability to, to provide frequency response as well. Um, so the flow on our cable is really uh, largely dictated by market prices. Um, and over the last year, they have been such that most of our flows are direction uh, GB. Um, and, uh, you know, um, that, that is really kind of, an, you know, driven by uh, the relative price difference, uh, higher prices in GB and, and, and lower in Belgium. Um, drivers of that are really, you know, in GB, the, the, the production mix uh, is uh, more focused towards gas and uh, there's a carbon cost that is higher than on the continent, uh, pushing, pushing higher prices. You know, Belgian prices are obviously influenced both by conditions in Belgium, but as well uh, through its neighbors, and is sort of more you know driven by nuclear capacity, uh, obviously a whole bunch of renewables uh, and a lower uh, carbon price as well, and a relatively um, uh, cheap imports from from Germany, and that has driven lower prices um, in Belgium. So maybe moving on and 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 looking a little bit at sort of our uh, intraday product, um, which is a nice one to talk about. Um, so this is this is the latest product that we introduced on, on Nemolink. Um, what we really do is, you know, for every delivery day, uh, we organize four auctions where market participants can buy transfer rights on our uh, cable. And, and really any capacity that wasn't sold at the day ahead stage uh, is then sold or made available at least to market parties um, intraday. Um, and then dependent on, on how you know, uh, intraday prices move, uh, market parties can decide to actually use that capacity that they bought the rights for um, and send uh, kind of a flow through our cable. Um, and, and this product is quite exciting in the sense that it allows market parties to react to movements in supply or demand that were not anticipated at the day ahead stage. For example, a sudden drop uh, of nuclear um, outputs or a deviation from renewables um, compared to the day ahead forecast. And that's what we're showing here. Um, earlier this month, uh, we had a, kind of a missed forecast of solar output uh, in Belgium. And we ended up with way less solar output compared to the uh, to the forecast. And so what happened is that balancing or imbalance prices in Belgium uh, shot up. Um, and market parties uh, reacted by um, essentially kind of reducing Nemolink's exports uh, to GB. Uh, and by reducing those exports, uh, contributed to uh, essentially kind of helping to bring the Belgian uh, system back into balance. Uh, so really kind of a nice use case of, of you know, how that product helps uh, the Belgian system, in this case now, uh, to deal with variable uh, renewable outputs. Maybe moving on, um, and conscious of time, I mean, uh, on, on the next slide, I just wanted to highlight a couple of the, you know, current market dynamics. Um, and what you see there on that chart is the daily average uh, price in GB and in Belgium uh, and what you see in you know over January and February you see a bit of a spread which is um, kind of usual you know as I mentioned GB prices tend to be higher than the, than the Belgian price um, but what we see happening you know over March and April is um, both of the GB and the Belgian price uh, coming down um, and particularly in Belgium, we've seen, uh, you know, the, the point where prices actually turn negative. This is now an average on a daily basis, but you know, individual hours, we've seen prices of lower than minus 100 euros per megawatt hour, um, really driven by, you know, kind of a, a set of relatively inflexible uh, nuclear power stations combined with um, quite a lot of solar and wind uh, generation. Um, so in that sense, you know, it has been quite interesting over the last couple of months, uh, you know, and as an interconnector uh, as, as well, you know, for us to, to contribute to uh, dealing with that surplus of uh, energy in the Belgian uh, system. Um, will this situation remain? Well, I mean, I guess uh, for, for now we see, you know, things stabilize a little bit. Actually, towards the end of the year, what we see is that the four prices in, uh, in Belgium and actually on continental Europe, um, shift up a little bit, uh, mostly as a result of uh, the nuclear reactors in France now, uh, which are experiencing very low availability. 
So what we actually see happening more potentially towards the end of the winter is, is more volatility on the upside, uh, at least in the continental uh, European power system. Um, and, and that means that these, these spreads uh, will narrow um, quite a bit. Last topic on the agenda is just uh, you know briefly on, on, on Brexit, um, a couple of points, uh, and that's on the on the next slide. Um, I mean, so first of all, uh, currently um, Nemo Link's capacity at day ahead is implicitly sold um, through market coupling. Um, that means that our capacity is sold together or implicitly with um, with power in a single day ahead auction. Um, this is you know, obviously very efficient in the sense that you know a trader doesn't need to make some some assumptions on you know what the day ahead price is going to be when they buy the capacity. Everything happens uh, together. Um, UK government wishes to maintain uh, access to market coupling, but that is at the moment not the position of the EU. Uh, so this will be a you know a continued discussion point uh, through the negotiations. Um, you know, failing any agreement, uh, the day ahead in the connector capacity will be allocated in explicit auctions from uh, 2021 onwards. And that means that essentially we first organize um, a capacity auction you know, as Nemo Link. Um, and after that, market parties go and secure the, uh, the power in a day ahead auction. Uh, so Nemo Link is ready to accommodate this. Um, we, this is actually already our fallback option if uh, market coupling fails. Just as a last point, I um, just want to highlight, you know, a couple of other or like a main other driver of, you know, uh, prices and 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 that price delta between uh, GB uh, and 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 Belgium and a little bit of an uncertainty. And that is really the the carbon price policy in the UK. Uh, so at the moment. UK is um, uh, you know trying to develop an emissions trading scheme uh, similar to what you know we currently have uh, in the EU, the EU ETS. Um, failing that uh, because there's not too much time left, um, there would be a fallback option of a carbon tax. And so, how that system will exactly look like, you know, what the price levels will be, uh, will be of uh, you know quite quite big importance to uh, the price uh, prices in, in GB. And obviously, then you know the price deltas uh, with the with the continent, and that's that's clearly something that we are looking at, and uh, you know our customers will be will, will be very much focused on um, as well. Um, so that is essentially kind of uh, what you know we we had to say um, on these three topics. Um, so um, I'll now just pass on uh, to Liz Brunson um, to continue. Thanks very much, Mona. Um, that was very interesting. Um, I'm going to skip quite briefly through um, some regulatory updates from um, the UK. Um, obviously, up until about February this year, Brexit was the big thing in town. Um, Mona has already covered you know, the, the effect of, of Brexit largely on uh, electricity interconnectors. Um, the guidance from the government on what's going to happen post Brexit has actually been in place since about July last year. It's been on the BES web, um, website. As you all know, we officially have left the uh, EU now. Um, we're in this transition period until December 2020, which is why that heading there is until December 2020 and from January 2021. Um, it's very much business as usual for electricity and for gas at the moment. Um, and on the electricity side, as, as Mona has said, we remain coupled to the electricity market. Um, what happens as of January next year depends very much on where we get to in the trade talks. Um, the mood music from last week's uh, efforts seems to be quite tetchy on the EU side. Um, they're saying we're not getting very far. Britain is being typically bullish, so you know, usual stuff. Um, one very obvious factor is the impact of COVID-19 on the talks. I mean, the people involved can't physically get together. In fact, some of them have had the virus, you know, they can't they can't have the sort of negotiation that they might have been expecting. Um, both sides are saying we need to see progress by the end of June. Um and you know, if we don't get a trade deal, then we will crash out in the, the no deal Brexit scenario. Um, the UK government has said there will be no further extension. So um, where we get to on that, I don't know. 
Um, they did talk about energy last week in the talks, but I think most of the progress was made on nuclear cooperation. So really all we've got to go on at the moment is um, the government's paper that they published in about February, which was called The Future Relationship with the EU, the UK's Approach to Negotiations. Um, and that did talk about interconnectors um, and it talks about how important they were for cross-border trade. Um, and if we do have an energy agreement, then, you know, they would want to see interconnectors included in that. Um, but at the same time, the paper, as I say, is also quite bullish about when well, we don't we don't need an agreement anyway. So who knows where we'll end up with um, probably the biggest impact as it was um, when we discussed this last year is actually on Ireland um, because Ireland is split between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. The single electricity market, which on a piece of land that small makes perfect sense, is um, going to be challenging if there are no arrangements in place for cross-border trading. Um, that border doesn't really exist at the moment, but it will come back into existence legally if we crash out. Um, well, it, it's there now, but if we crash out that deal, it will become much more um, important. Um, couple of sort of more recent developments which I thought might be interesting to talk about now um, one of which is the Shetlands transmission project now technically this isn't really an interconnector because it doesn't link to member states but it's a subsea cable that links Shetland and Scotland um, and slightly unusually for the UK it's it's it is physically an interconnector that's being developed by an incumbent TSO uh, most of our interconnectors are not. They're done by, um, by private developers. And this one's being done by uh, Southern Hydroelectric Transmission, which is part of the SEC group and runs the transmission, owns the transmission network in the very north of Scotland. It's all operated by grid, but this is owned by um, SHET. Um, and it gives an interesting um, insight into the application of Ofgem's thinking under the price control regime, which we have for our transmission networks. Um, last week, on the 23rd of April 2020, um, Ofgem issued a revised decision approving this project, which is a reverse of its previous decision. Um, it's a 600 megawatt link. Um, it obviously links Shetland to the mainland. Um, Shetland, like many islands, relies on very heavily on localised generation. It has a very small distribution network. It's never been hooked into the Scottish transmission network. But because of concerns with IED on the generation side, um, plans for offshore wind, et cetera, et cetera, um, it has become apparent that an interconnector would be a very good thing. Um, but for an incumbent to develop an interconnector like this um, under its tra um, transmission price control, you need off-gem approval um, to be able to basically claw back the revenue um, under the price control mechanism. Um, various models can be used to get this approval. Um, and a previous application was actually made under what's called the competition proxy model, which kind of does what it says on the tin. Um, the modelling is done on the basis of benchmarked um, other projects, typically Oftos for this sort of thing. Um, this was rejected late last year because the main wind farm, which is looking to connect offshore from Shetland, which is the Viking wind farm, about 475 megs, didn't get a CFD in the last round of bidding and CFD being the UK government support system for renewables. Um, so SHET had to resubmit its application. Um, it reapplied using a different mechanism called the strategic wider works mechanism, which is another one under the price control, um, which is used for larger sort of uncertain projects where no one's quite sure um, how it's going to pan out. And it's split into two phases, you apply for pre-construction funding, you do some pre-construction works. And then when you've done those works and you have an idea of what the need is and what the costs are going to be, you make an application for the final needs case. And that's what was approved last week by Ofgem. Um, it is conditional, uh, that approval. Uh, by the end of 2020, the TSO must provide sufficient evidence that the Viking wind farm will actually get built. Um, so that was an interesting one. Um, rattling on because we are a bit short of time. Um, the other one I wanted to talk about was uh, UNC Mod 678, which um, any of you who are unlucky enough to be trying to work out how the Harmonised Transmission Tariff Structures Code is going to be implemented in the UK will be horribly familiar with. It's a bit of a beast. Uh, it's had many of us scratching our heads for quite some time. Um, but it basically um, so it implements the tariff code in the gas market in the UK and the UK system uh, being what it is, we have to consult on everything, which meant we had 11 different price methodology proposals in that mod. So it's taken some time. 
But last Friday, Acer issued a report saying that it thinks that the proposed postage stamp methodology that's in 678 is compliant with EU rules, which we still have to comply with until the end of uh, December. Um, there's some interesting reading in there if anyone wants to have a look at it. Uh, so it's on the Acer website. Um, the relevance to interconnectors, again, largely relates to Ireland, actually, on the gas side. Obviously, um, Moffat is key to Ireland's gas supply, uh, provides a lot of gas through there. And so Acer was very keen to ensure that the NRAs, both Ofgem and the relevant NRAs and other EU countries, monitor the tariffs, um, not only at Moffat, but also at Bacton, where IUK and BBL come in. Uh, to make sure there's no distortion in cross-border trade or negative impacts on EU integration. Because um, as I said earlier, Moffat is, is very key to Ireland's gas supply. Um, and finally, just on current markets, and so I know we are going extremely quickly, but we are a bit short of time. Um, obviously, we're in a, an ex unprecedented time um, in terms of uncertainty. Demand across gas and electricity markets has been turned on its head. Industrial demand has gone down. Uh, domestic demand has gone up. Um, we're hearing people talk about instead of headroom, which is the extra capacity you might need to meet shortfalls, we're talking about footroom, which is how do you soak up excess uh, generation? And there are various interesting and learned articles on that on the web. Um, and the final thing I wanted to point you to um, was that EMR, the delivery body for EMR in the UK, has literally just published uh, about an hour ago uh, it's modelling methodology for the derating factors for interconnected countries and they want feedback on it. So if anyone is interested in that and has a quiet couple of hours this afternoon, do have a look on the EMR delivery body uh, website. I'm sure many of you will have had the email um, and they're looking at the, the age old issue of derating on interconnectors. Um, apologies for the speed at which I rattled through that. Happy to take questions at the end or indeed if anyone wants to get in touch afterwards, please do. I'm going to hand over to my colleague Johanna who's going to uh, talk about some of the planning updates that we've had recently. Thanks Liz um, and good afternoon everyone. I'm just going to, as uh, Liz said, skip us through some headlines on development of environmental regulation uh, post-Brexit because there has been movement in this area um, and the um, the government uh, has been, um, well, until, until the C word, uh, rather busy pushing its environment bill um, forward through Parliament, but it's currently been suspended um, because of, of, of current state of affairs, but it's almost through and what the effect of that will be uh, is to uncouple effectively the UK environmental regulation um, regime, um, at least in England, um, from that of the EU. At the moment, we're still um, in the status quo, obviously, um, until uh, the end of December this year. Um, and the environmental and strategic impact assessment procedures are, are obviously um, maintained. The framework of that will be retained. Um, but I think the overall, the net result will be same but different in terms of environmental regulation going forward, um, at least in this country, and the way that your projects might be assessed. Um, the methodology will probably remain the same. The Environment Bill will adopt most of the um, principles. But what you might see is a divergence in subject matter and um, and certainly some, some differences across jurisdictions. Um, so just skipping forward, thanks Chloe, to the next slide. The um, Potential areas for divergence that you might see then uh, opening up as we go forward uh, between the, the countries in the UK. So the, the Northern Irish can opt in to the Environment Bill, um, but the Welsh and Scottish uh, administrations are, are free to go their own way now. And they have both uh, consulted on, on separate um, regimes. At the moment, all of these um, proposals do very closely mirror the current the situation and, and, and the status quo. Um, but like I said, that, that uncoupling does give all of these jurisdictions the scope to go forward differently. Um, the Environment Bill that's currently going through the English Parliament um, does specifically envisage that there will be um, some movement away from centrally set targets. Um, and the four principles that you might see, the most movement, um, uh, in relation to air quality, waste, resource efficiency, uh, water and nature. And I, I mentioned simply two that might be of interest. The, the air quality target area is um, possibly going to be a, a, a help to the industry because uh, it will encourage greater take up of renewables and transmission of renewable energy. Um, so interconnected projects should be viewed 
uh, fairly favourably, you would, you would hope, um, and in relation to um, potentially nature and assessment of, of impacts of onshore kit. Um, so there might be some divergence in terms of the types of, um, of, of things that are assessed. There might be a move away from um, EU designated habitats or species, um, and they might be readjusted in terms of more locally significant features or, or habitats. Um, so there, there could be potentially some different areas um, of, of assessment. But like I said, broadly, the EIA regime will, will remain the same um, and, and, and the process for assessing projects. Obviously, the TENI directive, if you've been involved in any um, projects that, that are subject to TENI, that obviously depends on the outcome of commercial negotiations as to whether that process will continue to apply. Um, thanks, Chloe. Next slide. And just very quickly, finally, one thing to note, um, grown new regulator on the block, um, the OEP will take the place of um, the, the EC in England at least, and um, oversee and scrutinise uh, the, the public authorities that administer the new regime. So it will, for instance, be overseeing how the Environment Agency, the Marine Management Organisation, Natural England and others um, it, it, uh, it implement these um, these new policy requirements. There is a question mark over where the public authority in this context could also catch um, utilities and um, potentially TSOs who are public authorities. So that's one to watch. But um, certainly, um, if 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 you have a project coming forward that interconnects into England at least, um, there'll be um, potentially a new uh, a new regulator and you sit at the table to be aware of. Um, but like I said, at the moment, very much still um, uh, business as usual, but um, down the track, there could be some some interesting developments and um, England at least could, could be going in, in a different direction. The outcomes of the Welsh and Scottish con consultation still remain to be seen. Um, they are starting out fairly aligned, but uh, again, just something to be aware of going forward if you're going to connect into any of those countries that there could be um, some additional environmental regulation requirements to take account of. And But that's me. Thank you. Any questions, of course, please please do send them through on the chat. Thanks, uh, Liz and Johanna. And thanks as well uh, to uh, all listeners for uh, participating to this uh, uh, forum uh, webinar. My name is uh, Wouter van Dorpen. I'm a counsel at the EU Energy and the Utilities team of uh, Field Fisher Brussels, and, and we're uh, dealing on, on a day-to-day -day basis with, with the follow-up of energy legislation, um, specific uh, specifically as to new uh, developments and, and market players and, and how regulation correlates with uh, this. Um, this presentation of, of about 10 to 15 minutes uh, will be dedicated to, to the recent uh, Baltic uh, cable case, which is an important and interesting uh, judgment by the European Court of Justice, as some of the participants know from uh, first hand. Um, just to situate uh, the project and the company, the project or the, the interconnector itself is an interconnection, uh, interconnection as you can see on the map, between uh, uh, Sweden and uh, uh, Germany and is built already in 1994. Um, Baltic Cable, the company, uh, is uh, to be categorized or considered as a single interconnector or merchant interconnector, uh, which is basically a company that is uh, um, uh, predominantly uh, focusing at one specific asset of interconnection, as opposed to the more, I'd say, a, a traditional uh, uh, TSOs who uh, um, are mainly considered with uh, dealing with the transmission grid in a specific area with specific end customers and with specific uh, tariffs. Um, the case deals with an, an issue on, on the destination of what is called congestion revenues. Huh? In case there is congestion, there are price differences between the markets, between the member states. Um, and dealing with this congestion and trying to solve uh, uh, this congestion brings about a specific revenue to the owners of the interconnection. Um, and that is called congestion uh, revenues. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, I, I try to point out uh, the 
discussion that is ongoing, that was ongoing in this case, that was a discussion between the Swedish uh, inspectorate and Baltic uh, Cable, the inspectorate uh, stating that or deciding that Baltic Cable uh, should place its congestion revenues, uh, as defined, uh, on a separate account uh, until it can be used for specific purposes, namely enhancing availability of the grid or enhancing capacities. Uh, such as investing in new interconnectors, and for nothing else. Um, the Swedish inspectorate justifies its, its claim or its, its decision by uh, stating that such is required by EU law, namely by the regulation 714-2009 on cross-border exchange, as, was, as, as one of the measures to um, <clears throat> to reduce or not incentivize congestion, huh? as you know, the fewer congestion, the better. Um, so that such is required by EU law. Of course, Baltic Cable disagreed with that by uh, um, having the uh, I'd say uh, um, market view and, and, and stating that these specific uh, uh, congestion revenues represent uh, around 70% of, of their revenues. So this decision would not be livable uh, uh, for Baltic Cable or for any kind of single interconnector. And that as a single interconnector, they want to use part of these congestion revenues uh, uh, plainly as a return and to cover for the operation and maintenance uh, costs. So the discussion went <clears throat> uh, via a, a prejudicial question by, by a Swedish court, went to the European Court of uh, uh, Justice. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, uh, the, the, the legal issues in the uh, European Court of Justice uh, uh, case were a matter of, I'd say, a tension between IDs. Huh? Um, there was the question of how to uh, how single interconnectors must be treated. Do they need to be treated in the same, in exactly the same way as normal TSOs, or are they a specific category uh, of interconnector uh, uh, projects? There was also a big clash or tension between reading the old legislation, namely the 10 years old uh, regulation 714 2009 in the context of uh, uh, modern times uh, in which we can see that there's a, a specific single interconnector uh, uh, projects on ongoing the main clash from a legal point of view was between the principle the legal principle of proportionality because baltic cable felt it very disproportionate to um, have imposed uh, uh, the same conditions and obligations as uh, uh, traditional TSOs um, versus the, the difficulty that uh, the Swedish inspectorate as, as a regulator encountered in um, not acting contra legem against the law. Uh, if the regulation 714-2009 was clear on uh, how to deal with congestion revenues, the regulator cannot deviate therefrom. So that was the difficulty from a legal point as, as, as view as well. So this all led to a discussion of, of, of wording of one specific article, namely Article 16.6 .6 in that regulation. And the judges tried to find out what it really meant, uh, what it really means uh, uh, today, uh, what the ratio legis, uh, the intention of the lawmaker is uh, behind it, etc. And the big question is whether or not the EU treaty itself needed to intervene, uh, needed to uh, be used to correct, potentially correct one of its own laws, namely the wording of Regulation 714-2009. Well, um, as you can see in the, on the next slide, uh, uh, in the decision of, of, of the uh, European Court of Justice, uh, at the end, it didn't go that far. Uh, in the judgment, the EU treaty was not needed uh, to solve the um, issue. Um, and the, uh, according to the judges, the solution was found in the regulation itself, which is written in a rather 
broad style stating that deviations are allowed, single interconnectors, that's Article 17, single interconnectors can be exempted from various measures. And of course, the ratio legi is the goal of the regulation itself, namely always trying to find market-based solutions for interconnections, financially acceptable conditions, etc. So, according to the judges, there was enough margin in the regulation to allow regulators to impose a specific measure to single interconnectors. Um, next slide, please. So the court decided that the, a, a regulator towards a, a, a single uh, interconnector is allowed or can decide uh, to um, have part of its congestion revenues uh, used to make a return as well as for cost covering of the, the O&M cost, taking into account or inclusive of an appropriate uh, profit. Um, so what must we remember from this uh, Baltic Cable case? Well, first of all, um, this is a victory for single interconnectors. That is clear. Huh? Um, secondly, uh, um, as you might see on the next slide, uh, this victory is a, a, a recognition for single interconnectors as uh, a special or specific categories uh, of uh, interconnectors, maybe distinct from the traditional TSOs, huh, in which uh, they're not always to be treated in exactly the same way as the typical uh, TSOs, and that regulators must look at the characteristics of a, a, a company before deciding. Hmm? Single interconnectors can, can now better decide how to use their congestion revenues, and foremost, it gives some level of legal certainty to single interconnector project in their business plan as to income and revenue. Of course, open question remain. Eh? Does that give a carte blanche for a single uh, interconnector? And how does it correlate with the main idea that congestion at the end should not be incentivized whatsoever? And of course, what is meant by uh, um, giving the possibility to use part of congestion revenues uh, uh, as an income? What is that part? Is that 5%, 10%, or is it 95%? European Court of Justice was very clear that it's now up to the regulators, and of course the Swedish uh, regulator in, in particular for this case, to try to find a, I'd say, a financial regulatory balance. Um, as a final comment, it's, it's important to note that, that um, congestion uh, uh, revenues uh, are now dealt with in Article 19 of the new uh, uh, Internal Electricity Market Regulation of last year uh, within the framework of the Clean Energy Package. Um, Article 19 is, is, is much broader on the possibilities for uh, uh, regulators to go case by case uh, and to uh, align uh, or give specific measures to single interconnectors um, and a new ASO guidance is expected uh, uh, shortly on the uh, shortly on the uh, uh, methodology proposed by by the TSOs and the acceptance of ACER thereof. Um, as a conclusion, to our opinion, the, the Baltic Cable case is a very important and, and landmark uh, ECJ judgment for, for single interconnectors uh, now and for the uh, future. I, I'll leave it here and, of course, I'm open for, for further questions at the end of the presentations. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's uh, Matthew Grant here from Beringa to um, I think close out the, the formal presentations from our side uh, before we open up to discussion. Um, I'm, I'm going to move us slightly off the kind of topic of classic interconnectors into an interesting topic that is, is, is quite topical at the moment in the sense that it's a uh, an area of kind of infrastructure development through hybrid projects or hybrid interconnector projects, which has seen uh, quite a lot of focus from both policymakers from a top-down perspective, but also from a 
bottom-up perspective in terms of developers looking at these project uh, solutions. So I'll start with a very quick introduction to Beringer Partners and, and what we do in this area. Um, a short kind of definition of what we mean by hybrid projects or hybrid infrastructure projects. And then I think really focus on some of the key development challenges that we found from working on interconnector with interconnect clients and, and governments and regulators uh, on both classic interconnectors and hybrid projects uh, to pick out some of those challenges and some benefits and opportunities for project developers. Um, so if we just jump to the next slide, I won't dwell on this one. This is really just a kind of a bit of a background to who we are. So Beringer Partners is a management consultancy um, that offers a range of services across energy and financial services. Um, within the energy sector, we work from across the supply chain from generation uh, through transmission, working with regulators, uh, governments, through to kind of commercial opportunities for uh, investors and, and a range of different clients in the retail markets. Um, we're based in London, but have offices uh, out of um, Belgium and, and Germany as well. So we're well, uh, well positioned across, across Europe. On the next slide, it's a bit of a kind of double header really to give you a bit of an idea of the type of work we, we do in this area, but also it's kind of a good summary of the type of issues and things that are relevant for hybrid project developers. I should just say that the reason that hybrid projects become so interesting is because they, they move away from the, the classic point-to-point -point interconnector world of, of looking at the, the benefits of arbitrage uh, and security supply into a world where you can combine that um, that kind of wholesale kind of market benefit, consumer benefit, with additional renewable deployment on specific assets that are connected to interconnectors. The definition is, is relatively broad, but but in general terms, what we what we mean when we talk about hybrid projects and the most common um, application of that across Europe is certainly looking at offshore wind and interconnection interconnection combined assets. Um, so on the next slide, um, just move to slide four. There we are, sorry, um, slide 25, apologies. Um, so interconnection, from the interconnection side, revenue projections um, are kind of critical in terms of looking at the commercials. Um, the kind of regulatory engagement, so clearly any type of hybrid project moving away from our status quo or current understanding of, of interconnection, although be it not, not always completely uh, straightforward as we saw, saw from the previous presentation. Um, the regulatory engagement and the regulatory uh, kind of strategy is critical when you're thinking about regulated interconnectors and exempt projects. Um, from an investor perspective, the kind of the, the roles around kind of looking at the due diligence and the overall risk and operating models of these projects is, is clearly critical. Looking at the kind of simple offshore wind analysis, so looking at things like merit order analysis, uh, due diligence and operating models are critical if you're going to align the incentives of both interconnections and offshore wind. An understanding of how these two things fit together is, is going to be central to, to kind of concluding whether these projects are viable. A couple of projects that we've worked on in the past um, that very much focus on this area are some work we did for, for, for the British government back in uh, early kind of 2012, 2013, which is a long time ago now, but really shows how long these questions and issues have been on the table. Um, and then a further piece we did for the Scottish Government looking at a similar concept, which was how do you combine different definitions of infrastructure um, in a way that hasn't typically been, been thought through? Um, and in some instances, this is, a, this is a GB or UK construct, given the way that transmission investment is separated out in, in, in GB compared to a kind of more centralized TSO-led model uh, in other European countries. And that very much leads on to hybrid projects. And we, we certainly focus on the, the kind of policy design for hybrid projects and looking at those, combining those regulatory and commercial arrangements through cost benefit, benefit analysis, and also looking at the kind of wider economic benefits. On the next slide then is really just, a, you know, what are we really talking about when we talk about hybrid projects? Um, so the left-hand side of this slide is, is actually a, a screenshot that I've taken from um, one of the original, well, in my understanding of it, really one of the original uh, projects looking at um, hybrid in, or multi-purpose projects, which was the North Seas Countries Offshore Grid Initiative back in back in 2012, which is something I was involved in from from my prior role with with Ofgem. Um, and this very much, as as more recent studies that I've kind of lift, listed on the right, kind of set out the definition of what what hybrid projects could look like. And whether that's a combination of offshore wind with interconnection um, has an, a local coordination element, which is something that's been a kind of focus of Ofgem's attention from a, from a GB offshore wind perspective. It's fair to say the success of some of the coordinated offshore wind um, infrastructure has, has been limited to date, given 
a number of factors, but we'll, we'll come on to those challenges shortly. Some of the earlier projects, particularly from a, from a GB perspective and an Irish perspective, considered combining elements of interconnection with offshore wind and onshore reinforcements, which really kind of puts all the kind of options around transmission use uh, together. Um, and uh, interestingly, there was, a, there was an MOU signed with the GB and Irish government, uh, I think back in 2012, 2013, that was very much focusing on this idea of renewable export and the way that you could try and combine uh, renewables and resources in, in different markets and provide direct and dedicated export cables that could have these multi-purpose or hybrid functionality uh, into different markets. On the right hand side then, just, just as a bit of a, a bit of a theme here, it's kind of that this the topic of hybrid projects is 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 a current one um, in the sense that this is this is clearly an area of interest for a number of parties, but it's certainly not a new one. Um, so in my relatively short 10 year 10 years in the energy industry, this has been around from the very beginning. Um, as I said, from the start, from the kind of Nuskogi uh, kind of initiatives, moving through to these some of these MOUs, the role of NSOE and, and the way that NSOE was kind of initiated through the third package, and I suppose more recently the way that we're seeing projects putting forward in the TYNDP that have coordinated or, or hybrid infrastructure um, kind of credentials. And then I suppose more recently some of the, the kind of commission-led and, and industry-led work around uh, promotion, looking at offshore um, MEST HVDC offshore grids, the North Seas Wind, the North Seas Wind Power Hub, and, and the North Seas Energy Cooperation, which are all similar on a theme in the sense that they're looking at how different infrastructure can be combined to create some some really interesting and, and, and valuable uh, assets to uh, society. So if we just jump to the next slide, really, this is the one I wanted to focus a couple of minutes on, which is trying to, I suppose, pull together some of our thinking at, at Beringa and, and uh, through working with our clients and, and a range of different parties around what are the kind of the key challenges for these types of hybrid or meshed infrastructure projects. And here we've kind of split them out into four, four broad themes, but as you'll probably see towards the end of the slide, a lot of them are very much overlapping. Um, but but picking, up, picking out a few really, from, from a legal and regulatory perspective, one of the key and one of the kind of things that hits you front and center when looking at this type of infrastructure combination is kind of the asset definition and how narrow and inflexible infrastructure assets are defined in, in either national law or European law. So a classic example is, is just looking at the definition of interconnection. And first of all, the fact that that differs somewhat between some national and, and European level um, legislation adds some, some interest into the question. But also it's very much that some of these, some of the laws and the legislation and the licenses were clearly not written in the mindset of a, of a hybrid uh, combined asset, um, which is why it, from the start, from the get-go, you have to start thinking about this as a slightly more coordinated solution rather than kind of building it up from a project-by-project -project basis. Taking that forward, obviously the risk allocation in the simple example, if, if you could call it simple, of looking at offshore wind and interconnection, the risk allocation between those different parties and investors and actually the allocation of that risk onto consumers is clearly critical. Um, so, for example, the, the, uh, the degree of regulatory underwriting, anticipated investment and the trading arrangements for that, that, that entity um, are critical if you're thinking about how, in that in that example, how wind would provide a uh, or, or have access to a market and be able to receive subsidies if that was a if it was a kind of regulated project um, through using a kind of piece of shared infrastructure uh, that creates some real real kind of technical and, and regulatory challenges. But that kind of leads on to the revenue uncertainty and the financeability challenges from from an investor perspective. Um, Obviously, we know that interconnected revenues are are uncertain. In a, in a classic arbitrage example, um, they're, they're clearly driven by market fundamentals between two two markets, but I suppose much more more broadly now, given that we have a much more interconnected uh, European grid. This idea of priority access for generation is, is certainly critical. So the extent to which an offshore wind farm would require or would need a priority connection in order to uh, be eligible for, for renewable subsidies, for example, um, the CFD and GB or, or, or elsewhere, re uh, renewable subsidies elsewhere. That would clearly create a big challenge from a kind of revenue and financeability perspective if that was put in, in question. Um, and I think some of the classic questions around interconnection around with the kind of choice of regulatory model. So I was heavily involved in developing and, and working on the cap and floor regulatory model in, in the UK. Um, now, obviously, that model is slightly different in other European member states, looking at a slightly uh, a, a single regulated return model. But 
the simple choice between a regulated or a merchant exempt type project for these hybrid projects is clearly critical in terms of the level of regulatory underwriting, the extent to which that risk, that kind of project entity risk is passed on to consumers or is, is held with the um, project entity itself. Therefore, from a financeability perspective, um, one of the key things I think here is, is looking at the extent to which this is a single asset, a uh, single develop, developer-led asset, or if it's a combination of parties who are coming together um, with different expertise, some from a wind perspective, some from an interconnection perspective, let's say, um, to develop an asset uh, in a coordinated fashion. Um, clearly, the extent to which those, the interests are aligned between those, part, those parties is going is to uh, create some challenges around how that project is financed. The revenue and regulatory uncertainty and the allocation of that risk between different parties in an investment case is, is, is one of the, the kind of key challenges that we foresee. Um, and I suppose more broadly, the kind of the first of its kind uh, nature means that these projects can be sometimes can be hard to, to finance if they are combining different asset definitions that we talked about before. I'm kind of conscious of times so I won't dwell on governance, but I think maybe you know one of the one of the classic ones here is thinking about those different investor types, um, sorry, these different developer types and their interests and their asset ownership structures brings into question lots of um, you know well-known challenges around unbundling limitations, how those would be applied in a kind of combined asset um, or correct combined infrastructure uh, solution, and how that would work from a kind of legal legal and regulatory um, compliance perspective. The final point on this slide really is looking at redistribution of value. So in a classic interconnector space, we know that through things, processes like the cross-border cost allocation mechanism that the commission introduced, um, there is a mechanism to reallocate value across across borders for conventional interconnectors. Um, that that principle becomes kind of heightened and even more important in a in a hybrid project case because you're looking at the role, the extent to which value is not just from interconnection but from offshore wind is being allocated between different parties, um, and that really creates some interesting questions around who benefits, who benefits most, and how should that benefit be allocated between parties who who benefit less um, to ensure this can be a political and regulatory sound solution. Just on the final slide then, just to kind of dwell on a few a few kind of points around the benefits and um, and I suppose looking forward, um, there are the reason these projects have uh, appeal is because at a, at a very simple level, kind of ignoring the technical nature of these, but there is an extent to which these provide capital cost savings, um, particularly in terms of redu reduction in capex. If you're combining infrastructure. The theory, you know, the, the practice should be that you're you're building less overall and therefore sharing infrastructure to for mutual gain. So, from a, from an investor perspective and from a kind of social welfare perspective, there's a uh, potential benefit there in terms of savings from cable costs or infrastructure costs offshore. They combine the the use of infrastructure in a way that is efficient um, and allows underutilized infrastructure in some cases to be. Uh, used more efficiently. So, where interconnection, in, in one example, if you're using an interconnector for renewable export, that could ensure that you know when the wind isn't blowing, the interconnector can be used, and, and vice versa. Now, clearly, the the devil is in in how the the market fundamentals are shaping up, such that the economics of those different projects um, come together. Um, but there are clearly some benefits there. Um, additionally, it's increasing cross-border cross border trade and, and the market integration uh, opportunities that we see with conventional interconnection, um, but combining that with the opportunity to provide a renewable export route for additional renewables um, that may or may not uh, be developed on a, on a single kind of point-to-point -point, um, basis, given kind of the cost challenges of, of some offshore infrastructure. I think just to close, really, I think I, I think the messaging here is is very positive for for hybrid projects. So there's clearly a body of support pushing forward for a you know hybrid projects on the agenda. Um, we're seeing continued support from the Commission. Some of the northeast countries, um, for example, energy community are, uh, cooperation are really looking at this, um, and that work program really goes out to kind of the mid 2020s, 2023, I think, which which really shows there's a bit of a there's a there's a plan here. Um, although clearly that's not the only piece of work going on. Um, the clean energy package and particularly the regulation explicitly calls out some of the, the potential regulatory solutions for hybrid projects. It doesn't go that far, but at least it, it nods to the fact that hybrid projects are on the agenda, um, suggesting that exemptions and, and regulatory frameworks should help, should be developed to help overcome some of the barriers that are foreseen. Um, and further, the Green Deal is looking to, you know, provide an emphasis on uh, infrastructure and hybrid to kind of deliver some of the decarbonisation and net zero targets. 
Um, and then finally, you know, we are seeing individual projects from a kind of bottom-up perspective provide, you know, make meaningful progress with with projects. We've, there, are, there are a number of example projects across Europe um, who are making real kind of real progress, and, and it's really great to see that this is moving forward both from a top-down and, and a bottom-up perspective. So I think the, the outlook is positive. There are, there are clearly barriers and hurdles in the way, um, but I think there are parties who are see these projects as politically and regulatory very attractive. Um, and as such, there should be a way through it, subject to jumping over those kind of regulatory and legal hurdles that, that um, stem from the fact that, you know, the way that things are designed at the moment was not for hybrid projects. Therefore, there needs to be a bit of a step change to think about how hybrid, hybrid projects can be delivered to deliver value for, for Europe and ultimately for consumers. Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, if that concludes the presentations, we can move on to the Q&A now. Thank you to everybody who has already submitted questions. Just a reminder to all attendees that you can still submit questions using the chat function on your control panel. I see a few questions have already come in, so I will start working my way through these. But if you do want to add any further questions, please do, and we will get to those. If we don't get to your questions or you've got some points you want to raise outside of this forum, please do feel free to follow up with any of the speakers individually after the webinar. Our first question um, was directly to Nemo Link, which I see Monet has provided some specific comments on via the chat, um, but perhaps as a wider question for the benefit of all attendees, um, and perhaps either Wouter or David could answer this. Can you please outline the auction obligations of regulated TSOs and their freedom to cancel auctions for commercial reasons? Should I, should I take this one then, uh, Chloe? Or... Yeah, go go ahead, Mona. We will we will. Right, David, I mean, yeah. Okay, sure. I mean, maybe just uh, kind of um, I guess um, re repeat the answer that I noted down there. So uh, our our obligation is to, as a minimum, organize an, an annual and then monthly uh, auctions. Um, and so we we do have the flexibility, for example, now on you know specifically here the quarterly auctions. Uh, to 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 really take you know a commercial decision on 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 those uh, so in short we yeah we we do um, have flexibility I guess we're incentivized as well under our cap and floor um, uh, agreement um, you know to, to to take decisions in a in a profit optimizing fashion um, and so we we do take that very seriously as well I mean. Uh, Mostly because you know if we if we think that there's a risk that we will undershoot or uh, you know fall under the floor then then you know, there's a risk that we need to go back to consumers um, for uh, kind of additional initial funding under that scheme so we take that very seriously and, and we take the commercial decisions according to that. Yeah, maybe just to complement the recent uh, Craig decision, so uh, national regulatory decision on on your cap and floor system, isn't it? So. Uh, I think there is sufficient framework there, but uh, with 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 uh, commercial flexibility, both for the auctioneer and and the uh, and the candidate, of course. Okay, thank you. I see we've got some follow-up questions to that, but I will I'll come back to that one um, later. I think uh, there's a question for. Matthew, I think directly on hybrid projects, do you believe that the specific regulations that are in place for the Krieger's FLAC hybrid project, for example, regarding capacity calculation and allocation, are compliant with EU regulations? That's a good, that's a good question. Um, I, I suppose I must caveat to that I'm not a lawyer, so uh, that's uh, my reading of this is certainly from a kind of economist perspective. Um, I, I think, I think just as just background, the, the Krieger's FLAC example is is one of the one of the examples of of a current project that is clearly making significant progress um, that has these kind of hybrid project credentials. Um, we certainly looked at looked at Krieger's Flak, which, as you say, are are kind of using, um, if you like, the existing flexibility in the in the regulatory approvals around capacity calculation um, to to develop a route that allows a kind of coordinated output from from wind and the use of the interconnector. 
Um, I, I suppose I can't comment on on their compliance. I think, as we as we know, there's there's certainly some questions going on. There's some questions being asked around how that will work in, in practice, and and the regulators are working hard to consider and have have made some significant progress in considering these uh, calculation rules for for Kruger's flak. I think there's a there's a I suppose a wider point as to whether that type of solution is a long-term solution for for all types of infrastructure projects. So, um, sorry, all types of hybrid infrastructure projects. Uh, as an example, I think in in the GB context, um, the role of of the TSO, so you know, the uh, interconnection in GB, is developed uh, by separately from from the the, the ESO, National Grid, as the system operator and the transmission owner. It's developer led and other parties, including National Grid through their um, ventures uh, business, develop interconnection. So there's a bit of a disconnect between that central TSO role and ownership and operation of offshore and in offshore wind and infrastructure assets. So that differentiation means that so that kind of the Krieger's flag solution, if you like, may not be compliant or compatible in a direct way with with all kind of borders and all infrastructure solutions um, but it certainly does seem to be subject to passing um, all the right approvals a kind of a neat way of using existing rules to to meet a hybrid project need i think that does then beg the question as to whether whether that is a, a case of uh, not bending the rules but using the rules kind of flex the current rules flexibly to deliver an infrastructure project that that doesn't quite fit in those rules or um sorry and whether that would actually be better delivered through a slightly more bespoke and, and um more medium term arrangement that would consider it from a kind of specific hybrid project perspective um, but it, it's certainly a good question david do you want to elaborate on the compliance aspect or, or liz liz feel free i'm sure you have um, your idea Nothing more from me on that one. <laughs> no, I think well, the the on on the compliance, I think it is, it is a, a more general tendency where where we see that an a Baltic case decision hasn't been different. At the end of the day, it will be very much it's a, a, a NRA National Regulatory Authority decision, or well, in the case of interconnectors, at least two. Um, so. It, it, it is hard to indeed to that question to provide for a, a general answer uh, except for and i think that uh, <clears throat> that has been uh, matthew's experience as well as as a former of them official uh, do do have do have uh, uh, contacts with with the regulatory authorities uh, in such a way that they feel that you uh, you you are working you try to work on on a win-win scenario whereby, and I think the previous question was there as well, uh, when when Craig decided last month, 5th of March, say on the cap and floor for for Nemo. Well, that has been, of course, the result, as the document shows, by the way, of of a lengthy procedure, of lengthy uh, sets of discussions, and that's that's the way it should be, just to uh, minimize, to limit the risk of of say regulatory uncertainty or. Uh, having decisions that possibly need to be challenged. Uh, but um, so that would be my my input at this stage, uh, really, Laura. Yeah. OK, thank you. Um, we have a question for Johanna. Are there any practical tips on speeding up the permitting process for interconnector projects? Um, I think that if you're talking generally um, about the um, the environmental impact assessment process, uh, it, because that's um, obviously what what we're still working to across all jurisdictions. Um, I think that certainly the um, uh, the approach uh, I think should be um, to take um, a, a proactive view of um, holistically what the project is. Um, rather than you know look, looking looking piecemeal start from um an, an overall perspective uh, ac across the length of the project i don't think that that is going to change as a result of any divergence um i think that even if the uk jurisdictions were to go separate ways i think that they would still want to know um holistically that there's been uh, no salami slicing and, and so forth so i think that it would still be prudent um, to, to start from that that basis, um, and generally speaking, and this applies in any situation, um, to remain proactively in discussion with uh, all, all regulators, um, make sure that um, 
in all jurisdictions involved uh, that um, you're reaching out to them. I think as a result of COVID that many of the regulators are under uh, obviously increased um, pressures, difficulties, time challenges, uh, they're not being able to process things fast enough. There's going to be a backlog after this of, of work to get through. So I think keeping um, keeping communication up with regulators is going to be very key immediately. Um, but yeah, long term, like I said, just uh, keeping an eye on and trying to preempt um, the environmental assessment issues across all jurisdictions, regardless of how regulation might may diverge um, and, and preempt any questions that um, that might be begged by the omission or otherwise um, of, of issues. Happy to don't, um, expand on that off, offline um, as well, if, if that um, gives rise to any further queries. Okay, thank you. And uh, Mona, I see you've already uh, provided some comments on the chat again on this question about Nemo Link's plans to implement 15 minutes space products in the DA or ID market. So I wondered if you wanted to expand on that. Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, on, on the NemoLink side, we are definitely keen and, and, and you know, we looked at this and, and uh, in essence, we'd be able to accommodate this. Um, I guess, I mean, two, two small comments is that uh, the, the GB system works in a 30 minute um, time unit, MTU. Uh, so, you know, that would be the become effectively the, the units that, you know, could be used on the um, interconnector, at least kind of the, the minimum um, uh, time frame. Um, and then secondly, um, you know, the implementation of this um, is at the moment, I mean, would require, require quite a bit of a development on um, uh, the joint allocation um, offices platform. Uh, so, so at this time, I mean, that determines the, the, the timing a little bit. So, um, yeah, we're dependent, uh, I guess, on that. Uh, so we don't necessarily see it as something uh, kind of for the, the short term. Okay, thank you. And another question for you, Hannah. Could you further explain how a divergence post-Brexit from the EU's EIA legislation could affect the inclusion of projects in the 10E process? Yes, sure. Um, that one will very much depend on where the uh, trade negotiations end up and whether or not the UK remains a part of the EEA uh, or a member state or part of the single market that the, the 10 e reg is applicable to, um, like I said, to, to EEA states and, and member states. So if we end up in, say, a Norway situation, 10 e would continue to apply to those those projects. But it does depend on where, where we get to with um, with the trade negotiations. OK, thank you. And I think a question for Matthew, is it getting any easier for merchant interconnector projects? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, I, I think I think probably no. Um, I think I mean we've always we've always merchant interconnector or exempt projects. I think it's, it's probably how we define them in terms of their regulation um, are subject to a number of different challenges. Uh, the biggest being the kind of the regulatory hurdle, uh, given that we know that the kind of commission is you know, the whole purpose of the rationale for developing the internal market and, and the regulations that sit around that are to ensure a consistent and coordinated approach to infrastructure assets and also infrastructure use and the, the challenge with an exemption but this very much depends on the scope of that exemption or the, the merchant exemption is it, it's it in some cases can the concern that it would erode erode some of those benefits now we've seen more recently that uh, exemptions are being being awarded and you know, we've seen um We've seen a few over the you know the past four or five years. Um, a notable one for a classic interconnector is, is clearly uh, Electlink. Um, whether the exemptions are subject to conditions that, that make them, I suppose, more acceptable uh, from a regulator's and commission perspective. Um, so to that extent, I think there are certainly things that can be done to make merchant projects more viable, and 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 they certainly can have their benefits. I think in a, in a hybrid project context, um, merchant or exempt projects certainly become quite interesting because it's a way of um, taking on a greater risk, uh, for example, around anticipatory investment or, or oversizing of assets that might be required for hybrid projects without passing that risk back to consumers. Now, and ultimately, the, 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 the choice to pass that risk back to consumers through a regulated model is one that regulators um, need to take. And, and one of the challenges to date around 
anticipatory investment in particular is, is, is regulators across Europe kind of taking a decision to um, or effectively a risk based on, on future asset use and passing that risk back to network consumers through through network charges, um, through regulatory underwriting. So I think in a hybrid context, I think merchant interconnect has become quite interesting um, and could be could be a possible uh, piece of the puzzle that helps to solve you know the hybrid project challenge that we're that we're seeing at, at the moment. Okay, thank you. And a question for Liz. Do you believe that constraint payments are an appropriate and necessary support mechanism for interconnectors in the UK? Um, it's, it's a difficult one because I said, as I said um, when I was doing my presentation, um, interconnectors within the UK are sort of slightly old creatures. Um, they have their role. I mean, it, it's it's a really difficult um, it's a really difficult area to to be general about. I think because each one is assessed on its merits, um, and you know the economics of each one have to be have to be looked at individually. Certainly, the um, the Shetland project um, was an interesting one where it, it, it ties back into what Matt was just saying about um, essentially building in redundancy in the wires and how you model that and how you try and uh and mold that into a price control um but i think um i think they have an important role to play but obviously the regulators need to uh, are, are very keen to ensure that they don't they don't become too burdensome for for consumers okay thank you and a question for david please can you give an update on the eu's clean energy package and specifically on the role of acer uh, the role on ESA, well, I think we have seen in the presentation the most relevant provisions of, of the uh, uh, for interconnectors, in particular the Article 19, um, with, with the discussion and congestion revenues. We also know that ESA is expected to issue a guidance on, on the matter soon. So, um, evidently, ESA has been profiling itself as, as say, the guardian of. Uh, application of of, uh, of regulations however uh, and i think there again baltic cable is some kind of landmark decision uh, in essence uh, when it will come to the to the calculation of the acceptability of say congestion revenues in terms of with what is what is a reasonable profit and all all, all the criteria that come into play uh, it, it will be says the the, the court of justice the the the, uh, the relevant NRAs who will take the final decision. So, on the one hand, we see ASA empowered evidently with the uh, with uh, 2019 943 and others. Um, on the other hand, we do see that there is a tendency where, when it comes for say specific economic application of principles set out by Court of Justice or by ASA in its guidances. The power there is with the uh, NRA. So I, hope I think to add on that, uh, um, maybe as uh, I think the congestion revenue uh, uh, issue um, uh, shows well what uh, the, the future augmented role of, uh, of the Acer uh, could be. Uh, if we talk about Acer and what can Acer do, we always talk about competence. Uh, what can Acer do? Um, can it act and decide for the NRAs or, or not? If we look at, at, at the, uh, um, the, the, the new regulation uh, uh, and the topic related to congestion revenues, um, it's now up to the TSOs to, to propose a, a methodology and it's up to ACER to accept this. But please be aware that this acceptance role or possibility is uh, uh, very limited. It can just accept or refuse and not have the discretionary power or, the, or make the initiative to add elements on, on that. So yes, it certainly has its role. Um, it can even decide, but the decisions would be uh, only of, a, a, I'd say, a binary nature, just accepting or or refusing so uh, uh, I think that's a good example of, of what the future role or the, the adapted role of, of Acer will be in, in the near future. 
Okay, thank you. I think that rounds off the main questions we had. I know we had a few more specific follow-up questions about the Nemo Link project, which I think we will follow up with after the webinar. Um, yes, it, it might be good indeed. I mean, we, we're happy to organise indeed a, another another contact between Mona and uh, and the uh, and and the, the the person's questioning because we can see indeed from the chat the uh, the relevance of the question. But I believe it 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 might deserve a bit more than a couple of minutes during a a webinar. But thanks thanks for the question. Thank you, David. And on behalf of all the speakers, thank you to everyone who's participated in this webinar today. We hope you found it a useful update on this area. Just a reminder that we will be circulating the slides from all the presentations delivered today, as well as a recording of the webinar to all attendees. But if you do have any further questions or comments, please, as, as we said, please do contact the speakers directly and, and we can help arrange follow up discussions if necessary. Um, in the meantime, Thank you again for your attendance and goodbye.